Well, I'd like to welcome everyone um, to the OER uh, breakout here. Uh, we're with Shannon and Aaron, and we're grateful for them and all their work that they do. Um, Shannon Smith is a scholarly communication librarian at USU Libraries. Um, she manages open access publishing efforts, including the institutional repository and the development of open educational resources, or OER. Her resource, uh, or sorry, her research interests include best practices and ethics for emerging library services, collaborative learning, and multimedia information behavior. Um, we're glad to have her. Uh, Aaron Davis is the head of learning and engagement services at USU Libraries. She works closely with faculty and students in the following liaison areas, kinesiology and health science, math and statistics, woo woo, I'm a stat professor, <laughs> and journalism and communication. Her research interests include information literacy, assessment, user experience, and professional development in libraries. So we are very grateful to have them uh, presenting to us today, and I will turn the time to them. Okay, hi everybody. Can you hear me okay before I get going? Okay, great. Um, so today, Erin and I are going to talk about um, open educational resources, primarily through the lens of considerations for them in COVID-19. Um, and since, especially since we're a smaller group, um, feel free to ask questions as we go. I know Todd will keep an eye on the chat. Um, and we, we have some built in time for you to um, provide feedback about your experiences as we go as well. So we'll be a fairly informal session today. Um, let me click on the right thing. So um, just to kind of set the definition a little bit, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation defines OER as teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. Open educational resources include full courses, course materials, modules, textbooks, streaming videos, tests, software, and other tools, materials, or techniques used to support access to knowledge. The O in OER stands for open, which is the distinguishing mark of OER along with the fact that they are nearly always digital, that is, they can be found online. <clears throat> Before we go too far, both Erin and I want to congratulate everybody for making it through both spring and summer terms, both hard and unusual times. We also want to acknowledge everything embodied in this quote. We've both been talking about this with each other quite a bit as well. COVID is hard, working from home is hard, switching to and learning how to teach online is hard. There has been communication coming from the library, but we want to make sure you're aware that course reserves aren't possible with quarantine requirements with COVID right now. The library is encouraging that you consider alternatives for course reserves. OER is one of those alternatives. This is both exciting and challenging. Keep in mind that OER run a spectrum. You can replace a primary text, keep <clears throat> or use materials for a single module, really whatever works best for your needs. Um, so this is actually a space where we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you're planning to teach online this fall, teaching face to face, um, if over the last couple of terms, if you had any students experience issues with accessing their materials. So Evie says in the chat, this is my first semester teaching with OER, but I'll be teaching face to face in IVC. Okay. So challenge there is first semester. <laughs> it's a big one. <laughs> it is a big one. It's exciting you're teaching with OER though. We're glad to hear that. Anybody else? I know it's 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 late in the day, so I, I get it if we're not talkative. Okay. So um in our COVID-19 world more than ever, available access to content has been the normal. What's challenging here um, is that while much of this content is actually kind of a faux open access space, um, meaning that publishers and other groups have taken down paywalls um, to help support online learning, 
as we were transitioning in spring. Um, those paywalls and barriers to access can return at any time. So an advantage to OER is by selecting and working with truly open access content, you can ensure your hard work builds a more sustainable model for your curriculum as you move forward. Where OER can also help is by providing you with options for your courses that are remote instruction friendly, fully open access, you won't have to jump that paywall or have an access code for your students. You'll provide your students with day one access without an expiration date to learning materials that don't cost extra money and also support lifelong learning. For you as instructors, you can use these materials without fear of copyright infringement. You can adapt the materials to your unique learning objectives, and you can distribute these resources with ease among your classes. Oh, I think, oh, I got myself confused here. Um, open educational resources are distinguished by what David Wiley refers to as the five R's. The ability to reuse, revise, remix, retain, and redistribute, allowing the most flexibility for tailoring your course learning objectives. And then this next slide is just kind of to show you um, that when you're out looking for learning materials, you're looking for the CC symbol for Creative Commons license to indicate that you're, you're getting more toward that ability to have those five R's versus the single C for a traditional copyrighted material. <clears throat> There's a variety of Creative Commons license um, that allow different permissions. And so this is just a quick overview. Um, if you're here with a CC BY, that is the, the most open you can be. Basically, you're, um, they just want you to give them credit, whoever made the materials. And so there's a variety of ways to approach this. I won't go into this a lot. Um, we're happy to help you with this process in the library if you need, but it's just to kind of give you a sense that there is a variety of licenses, but that little double C is what's going to stay the same no matter what. And then we're just gonna talk for a minute that a lot of people think that OER are only open textbooks. That is how we tend to market it to students, free textbooks. But OER is really so much more than just open textbooks. It's videos, handouts, presentations, course modules. The list is actually pretty endless. These are some of our favorite places to look for OER. They range from open textbooks to entire courses. You can find ancillary materials on here as well. <clears throat> One of the barriers to all of this is discoverability. So to help instructors locate open textbooks, we created um, a website, oer.usu.edu, with links to all of these repositories and some additional information. We do have an OER team here at USU, and we are here to help with searches if you're st stuck finding something. And you can reach out to the team or to your liaison in the library. Okay, so we thought this might be a good moment to do kind of a um, pause and reflect on, you know, just trying to think a little bit about how has, or if you've never used OER before, how could OER enhance your teaching practice? So we'll give you guys a few minutes to think about that, and then um, you can either share your thoughts in the chat or just feel free to unmute yourselves. So for Sarah O'Neill, um, she said, I had a cross-listed course with different requirements for different students. By using an OER, I didn't have to worry about making students purchase a book that they may only use once in a while. Yeah, and that's, that's something that we certainly hear from a lot of faculty, um, especially where it's, it's something where it's cross-listed. And so I think there, you know, there's so much encapsulated in that one comment, actually. But I do think that you know that's that's one of the the main advantages, um, or it can be an advantage to, to certainly using OER. And I think you know it's a lot of the things that um, that Shannon has already pointed to, especially in this in the in our COVID era right now. You know, I think this is something where uh, students certainly would appreciate that, um, just in terms of you know, it's ideal for it. it can be so adaptable. I feel like it's, um, it's something that, you know, can really fight kind of grant that freedom in this time of, you know, typical constraints. 
anyone else care to share anything about how they might think at this point OER could enhance their teaching practice or maybe from personal experience what they've um, what they've thought about it I I guess for in my perspective um, I was using an online textbook this past year that was not an OER. It was, um, you know, uh, something that the students had to pay for. Um, and um, the frustrations that came from that process uh, really kind of turned a lot of my students off um, from interacting with it. And so I just feel like um, something that's, that's less of a, um, burden on them um, would make them, I, it feels like if I was a student, it would make me more willing to um, interact with it um, if it didn't just kind of, uh, you know, have a negative connotation um, of, of being a financial burden. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I hope to kind of increase that accessibility for my students and therefore hopefully increase their likelihood of using that material and interacting with that material. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that because, and actually I'm going to send you, sorry for the shameless plug here, but I, um, I recently published an article with um, Avery Edenfield out of the Tech Com program on this very thing. And so we talked, you know, part of it was it was open access textbooks and a professional communication classroom. But one of the things that we looked at was students engagement um, in the readings. And, you know, with just now that now that they actually had this OER, were they going to use it anymore? Were they, you know, and we did a, it was more of a perception study. Um, so we were looking at a couple of different things, but that was, we, we really wanted to see if, um, if all of a sudden, if everyone had access to this, to this textbook, they were on a level playing field, so it's no longer waiting for the bookstore to get it in, or, um, you know, some of those affordability issues that you mentioned, you know, are they going to actually have a higher level of engagement with the, with the, cl with the book, and we found that they did. Um, this was a small pilot study, but I'll, I'll send that to you. But yeah, I love that. Thank you guys yeah. for that. Thank you for sharing that. It was a great example. Yep. Shannon, can you um, go to the next slide? And so now we're going to segue into um, this other concept of open pedagogy. And this is actually Dr. Rajiv Janjiani out of University of British Columbia. He's a really big advocate of OER and, of course, of open pedagogy. Um, and I felt like he, this is a great clip that kind of explains it. Maybe. <laughs> Can you guys see the video just to make sure? No, we can't. Okay. I got to switch what I'm sharing then. Okay. <clears throat> and I could also just explain it briefly if it's, <laughs> if the tech isn't working. No, it's just what I'm showing. Can you now? Yes. Open pedagogy is an access oriented commitment to learner driven education. It's also the process of using tools and building architectures for learning that allow students to shape the public knowledge commons of which they are a part. Open pedagogy might look like co-creating course policies, rubrics, or even schedules of work with students, or replacing traditional course assignments in which only the instructor may see the student's work with assignments that have a larger audience, impact, and legacy. This could involve students writing or editing articles in Wikipedia, writing op-ed pieces instead of another research essay, creating brief instructional videos instead of giving another classroom presentation, or annotating, updating, or even authoring open textbooks. To explore a diverse set of examples of open pedagogy in practice, visit the Open Pedagogy Notebook. OK, 
Okay, thank you, Shannon. Um, so you can kind of see it's it's really the practice of engaging with students as being the, the creators of the information rather than just being simply consumers of it. Um, and I think it, you know, it takes all of these concepts of OER that, that Shannon's already set us up with and it takes it into this, this next form of, you know, more of an experiential learning um, and where students can actually demonstrate their understanding and, you know, through this, this act of creation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, on this next slide here, you can see these are some of the, the main concepts of it. And it's, it's something that, you know, I, what I tell everyone who's, who's kind of, um, who's interested in, in getting into OER, that this is something, you know, that you could eventually maybe aspire to or build up to. It's, it certainly doesn't all have to, you know, it's something that I think it's, it's best done when it's incremental, um, because otherwise it can be, you know, really overwhelming. Um, but I think, you know, the, the great thing to think about with this is that the concepts behind it are that it's learner driven. So it's not just these disposable research assignments. Um, again, this is, if you haven't heard of that concept before, it's again, David Wiley. He was the one that Shannon mentioned before. Of, um, he's the one that really talked about the five R's. It's the idea of the assignment that's ever really ever seen between a student and the professor. And so they, you know, students work super hard on this paper all semester. And then, you know, maybe a few other students um, end up seeing it in terms of peer review, but they work really hard on it. And then, you know, that's pretty much it. And so we call it the disposable paper. Um, instead, this can be the transforming power of OER that it really, it, it brings together, you know, that this piece of um, teacher engagement, student engagement, and um, and I think that you know it's something that students can then they have this audience that is beyond just the professor. It's something where they can really feel like they can create something and can, can can contribute to it and not really just consume. And so it's really where we see them um, often taking ownership of their learning. And so I think that. Um, a couple of things. We're going to show you a few examples here in a moment of, of some really su successful collaborations. Dr. Rajiv had mentioned um, that open pe pedagogy notebook, which can be just inspiring just to kind of go through there and get some ideas, especially if you are in that place where um, you're thinking about maybe you know redesigning a certain assignment. The other thing that many, many faculty or instructors end up doing with this is that if they're really unhappy with their textbook um, or the main, the main resources that students are pointing to every semester, they end up having um, students create these different types of, um, you know, basically the students end up creating the textbook and, you know, they, they get, you know, a lot of satisfaction after, after you know, um, knowing that, you know, future, future classes are actually going to look back at their work. So here's the first example that um, Rajiv had mentioned, this open pedagogy notebook. And so with this one, um, I felt that this was really inspiring. This is actually one of Rajiv's classes that he was teaching. It's this principles of social psychology. Um, he was using an OER for the book, I mean, for the class. And for him, I mean, it's kind of like EV situation where it was the first time he was teaching it. Um, and so there weren't any ancillary materials. It wasn't something where, you know, he had all of the, the PowerPoint slides and, you know, the quiz banks already created. And so one, one small approach that he did that ended up being, um, you know, really powerful for him in terms of, you know, big time saver was actually having his students write four questions each week, two factual and two applied. So two that were like definition or evidence-based predictions and then two applied, which were more scenario types. Um, and he said, what was the result? My small class of 35 students wrote 1400 questions in the span of 10 weeks. And although I wouldn't consider this a polished question bank ready for use by other instructors, I still consider this assignment to have been a success. And he said that he really noticed a higher level of engagement, but also comprehension of the course materials by the end of the course, because I really felt like students, this is where I think you could understand that students would, um, they would kind of get motivated by, you know, by the thought of potentially seeing one of their questions, um, you know, be on the next test or the next quiz. And actually I've had, um, I've, I've talked to some other professors here at USU, and this is, a, this is one of the approaches that they took. So kind of, getting, you know, getting more of that open pedagogy concept. 
So another big player in this field of open pedagogy is Dr. Robin DeRosa. Um, and I really, I, I thought that this quote um, of hers really helped to encapsulate a lot of this. Um, open pedagogy can help us involve our students in our field's responses to the pandemic and remind us that the digital divide can complicate remote learning. Um, and I think that again, you know, this, our theme here of OER in this, in this age of, you know, of COVID and the pandemic, this is again where open pedagogy can really help in terms of opening up the potential of maybe what you can do with your class. Um, it, 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 I think it kind of gives you that flexibility. I think that um, as I keep stressing, it's not about changing everything. And I think it, it can really be about involving students in this now as a means to continue engagement in learning during a really hard time. Um, and I think that digital divide part of this quote, it's really important to be thinking about inclusive assignment building because we can't assume that everyone's going to have access to good technology and even things like microphones, broadband, even printers. So that's where I think, you know, assuming baseline needs, especially if you aren't teaching face-to-face um, -face or, you know, if your students are, if they're learning from a distance, this is where, um, if you're going to be building in more complex assignments in terms of digital needs, um, you know, then we have to be thinking about how we could support them. So all of that to say that these concepts of OER in general, um, kind of starting off with it, but also getting more into the assignment aspect of it, open pedagogy, um, we feel like we've given you a lot of information and so we want to make sure that you know about the library's OER website, which if you wanted to bookmark this on your computer, it's just oer.usu.edu. Um, and so we have a lot of this information that we already discussed today compiled on our OER website. And just so you know, we have a whole team of people who can help out. Um, so please reach out. You can see on the website here, you can learn more about the initiative if you're just, if you're still not totally clear on what it is or what it's not. Um, if you wanna see what we've been doing at, at USU on this front, you can see that. The great thing about um, the Find OER is where you, if you wanted to just look yourself, you can go in, in there and, and see like Shannon already showed you all those different, um, different sites, but of course, you know, that's also what we're here for as well. The OER at USU is really great to know about because that's where you, if you are teaching, like Evie, if you're using an OER this semester, um, we can actually feature your class um, on that site. And we also, we give those lists to our academic advisors so that they can help students to, to understand, you know, what, um, which classes are offering these open resources. Students can also find all of this information out in Banner as they're registering for classes. Um, and then we have a OER committee at, the, at our campus called the Affordable Learning Resources Committee. So in conclusion, um, we are here for you. You know, the main thing, the main takeaway here is that we have a whole team of people that can help you, including liaison librarians. Um, you're gonna get, you know, you probably have already seen quite a few emails from the library or from your liaison. And so um, we're here to help you. We don't feel, you know, please don't feel like you have to do this on your own. Um, if you ever have questions or just wanna start small, subbing out one reading for an open access reading, we'd be happy to help you with that. Um, the main themes here are, you know, open access, flexibility, and this concept of fighting isolation. So I think that um, the great thing about OER is that, you know, there's, it's online and there's always that digital component to it. Um, we have a couple of resources here that we've shared with you. So it's a, there's um, the OER and COVID-19 handout. That's what um, Shannon had referenced earlier today, some of the different starter kits that other, other universities have already created. And then if you wanted, if you're intrigued by this concept of open pedagogy, um, you just kind of want to see, you know, other examples of what people are doing in your field, um, that's a great place to start. I'll put links to these in the chat before we're done today too, so you guys can grab them. Thanks, Shannon. And here's our contact info. And you can see we also have a general OER um, email as well as the website. So just OER at usu.edu, super easy to remember. Um, and let us know how we can help. Are there any questions? 
Yeah, Aaron, so I have a question. I, I teach statistics and um, I'm all for OER uh, content. Um, the big challenge for me in statistics is I know that I have to have my students um, doing homeworks. Like, I mean, I, I can talk all day long and my right. students nod their head and say, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. And then they go and try to do it and they're like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, and th that's just, that's just statistics. And so I've always battled this with, um, so, so more recently I've adopted like online homework systems like WebAssign and things like that, just to facilitate giving them multiple tries. And, and it really, it really prevents me from having to build just yeah. massive amounts of, of canvas content. So, how does it work with OER? Are there good systems that people have built, um, is it, particularly with, with math or, or statistics? You need one that's, that's changing numbers and things like that. Um, that's, that's always just been the, the, the caveat is, is the homework issue for me is because I, I have to rely on that to help my students learn. So. And maybe this is just for statistics, so maybe it's not applicable to everybody here, but what, what would you say to that? So, That's a great question. Um, so Shannon and I both put a couple of different suggestions that just came off, you know, out of, out of our brains um, quickly here. I am actually you know, sharing with, the resources from the slides right now, but yes, keep going. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so it's the one, there's a, there's a great repository out there called OpenStax and they have, um, and I know there are different, you know, this is just for introductory stats, for instance, but the great thing about OpenStax is that this is the only OER that's out there that's actually peer reviewed. Um, so this part would, that would be free for your students and then they pair with, um, they partner with like Top Hat and a lot of these other providers. Um, you mentioned, what was it, the web I forget what it was called, but uh, the one I use is WebAssign. WebAssign. And, yeah, and right. they're always paired with big publishers like Macmillan and things like that. And so, <laughs> so that's one thing you could do. Um, you know, the nice thing is that um, if you if you actually ended up adopting one of their OpenStax books, if you go to their if you follow that link, you know, that it, it takes you to more of like the book details. Um, and you can see, you know, their table of contents and everything. You can, there are all these different versions of it, you know, the EPUB and the PDF and the, the HTML. But if you click at the top where it says instructor resources, this is actually where you can see um, all of their different technology partners. And so that's the piece where you would have to pay, there would be a fee. And I'm just looking through the list right now. I don't actually, oh, I do see WebAssign. It's further down the list, um, but they do partner with WebAssign. That's the piece where the students would still have to pay. Um, and it's anywhere between 26 to $40. But the really cool thing about that is that, you know, all of a sudden your students don't have to pay for this $200 plus, you know, stats textbook that, you know, they're going to be more than willing to, um, to, you know, to pay a, 20 bucks or whatever it is for, you know, the online learning platform. Um, the great thing to know is that we've actually worked with a number of the stats professors at USU. And so you could talk to them about their experiences with OpenStax. That's Thank just you. one repository, you know, one example, yeah. but that's kind of- I didn't know they had this many technology partners. That's, yeah. I, I'm, I'm familiar with OpenStax and I know that actually that intro stat book, but I didn't know they had this many partners. So I'll have to look into it more. I think they're a good entry point for that kind of thing. Um, I would say across the board in OER that that is a known issue. Um, the homework banks and mm -hmm. that side of things, like that's the real challenge. Um, so, you know, I would anticipate that that's something that will shift over time um, as more faculty develop things to share. Um, but that's, I mean, you know, that's just really the, the space where the work needs to be done. Um, I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just saying that, I mean, I think that's, that's the constant tension right now in terms of providing those supporting materials in a way that's meaningful. And I saw that, um, that Sarah had mentioned that, you know, same here, she's a foreign language teacher. And you might already know about it, Sarah, but there's a great site out there called Coral um, out, yes. of, out of Texas. I will add that. Thank you. 
and so that's where they do have, I mean, that's, that's a great, you know, that's like the open stacks, for instance, those are really just for the gen ed classes. So you're going to find more of, um, you know, like physics and chemistry, you're not going to see anything in foreign language, you're not going to see um, humanities. Uh, but, you know, they are working at, they're working at it. This is OpenStax and actually a lot of these different repositories that are out there, they're, they partner with universities and a lot of the times they're backed by really big foundations like the Hewlett Foundation and um, Gates Foundation. And so we say free, but you know, somewhere along the, uh, along the line, someone's paying for them, right? They're funding this. So um, with Coral, they have a lot of different featured pubs on here, language learning materials. Um, and this Modern. is where what's that yeah the different mm -hmm. modules yeah exactly and this is just kind of an example of what the OER support team can do for you um, that and actually I saw that Rachel Todd is on here as well um, oh she was she's our um, OER coordinator and so she you know she can also help you with this but that's where that's a lot of the, a lot of what we do is you know it's it's kind of talking through of course, you're the you're the subject experts, so you know we're never going to judge the quality. Um, tell you what's best for your class, but you know we can at least get you started. And I would say the other thing, you know, in terms of searching for materials is just trying to be. There's there's so many resources out there, <laughs> um, so we do encourage you to reach out for help with searches because um, we we want to try to mine what other libraries are sharing, um, other university initiatives too. Um, so as we learn things or, you know, maybe run into a weird dead link, we can ask questions and try to help build up that um, stronger network for everybody. Sarah, what language do you teach? Yeah, so that site might be really great for you. Any other questions? I have a quick question. Um, may not be y'all's realm, um, but it's kind of about embedding or integrating the OER into Canvas. Um, and I know, you know, so I, I want, I've got these readings for my students to do and I have, you know, expected due dates for them and it's for a face to face class. So I'm not doing um, The full kind of page of material that that that, um, you know, you might do for a uh, Online class, for instance. So I want to try to keep it from overwhelming them and just being too much um, You know, things that they have to scroll to to find their readings. Um, and so I can obviously I can put in an, just an external, you know, URL with Canvas, but I can't put a, a due date on that. Are y'all familiar with any way of um, kind of combining those two features where I can have the OER embedded or, you know, um, so that it pops right up on Canvas. I don't want them to have to, you know, spend too much time, um, you know, hunting it down on different places, but to also have a due date on it. Um, or maybe, like I said, it might not be within y'all's realm. It's just some. It's just a a uh, road bump that I've um, a speed bump that I've hit. That's a great question. Um, and are you just to clarify? You are talking about OER with it, mm -hmm. though, not not library licensed materials. Correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. OER. And that's yeah. This is actually it's a it's a really good thing to bring up because um, so first of all, Canvas. You know, they're um, or I mean, City. Their their instructional designers are going to be you know your best bet. They're going to. Okay. Yeah. Um, so whoever your assigned um, instructional designer is, you know, they'll, they'll get you through, they'll talk you through all of the best practices. But from my experience in working with faculty, and um, I think the big thing is one of the big hangups with, especially the, we did a pilot project a couple years ago, um, and, and one of the professors really had a lot of their links that we are like just kind of buried in the syllabus portion. Mm -hmm. And so instead of having it in the weekly announcements or in, in modules or links several times, um, I think they, it was more of this expectation of just kind of, you know, go back th to the syllabus and, um, and that's where track students- Track it down yourself. Track it down. Yeah. Like we're not going to, you know, hold your hand here. But 
um, that's where I think a lot of students really got lost and they had a hard time following through on those mm -hmm. links. And so I think that probably the first thing I would just recommend if it's possible, I know it's annoying, would just be to have it in multiple spots. Um, have it maybe linked, you know, linked it within your your schedule or your syllabus, but then also have it in your modules or your, you know, however you're setting up your yeah. Um, your course readings and then just linking straight out to it. I'd say just in terms of accessibility, you know, you want to be really careful in terms of PDFs. Um, you know, that's going to be the accessibility. That's, that's not going to be accessible. So making sure right. that you're linking whenever possible. Does that answer any of yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, that, yeah. Um, I, I, like I said, I knew it, it might not fall under y'all's realm and it might not yeah. be something that's possible in the, you know, state of Canvas. Um, I'll have to talk to the city team. Um, but I, you bring up a really good point of just linking things directly from the syllabus too, that I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about doing that. Um, and, and then, like you said, just having it in multiple different places and, um, you know, uh, yeah. hopefully, hopefully those types of kind of, um, students not being able to find the things they're looking for can be avoided that way. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to do a couple of shameless plugs here too <laughs> for, for different ways. If you are using library license materials and you're not sure about linking that, we, we actually from the library side would prefer that you link to the article in our resources so that the students are forced to go through the paywall and sign in. Um, rather than pulling the PDF and linking that. And the reasoning for that from the library side is then we get the counts of usage to help us know how best to support USU as we have to move forward with continuing um, to purchase appropriate things for the whole community. So that's just something to be aware of if you do use library licensed resources in your Canvas courses. Um, and then the other thing in terms of OER with students, Something I'm seeing a lot is um, because it is really easy for students to find and it's accessible, a lot of students don't realize their teachers are using OER. Um, so it might be worth um, just letting your students know that in your syllabus or somehow early on in a lecture um, so that they know that you've gone to that step and why it's important to you as just kind of a little helping educate them too. Um, that they do have access to those materials after they're done taking the class, that they can print them off, that they, you know, that they have some ownership in how they use it as well. Because um, I think, I think that it's easy to bypass that piece. And I, I, Aaron and I have both had conversations with like student senate representatives this year, where they're like, well, nobody in our area is using OER, teaching with OER. And we're like, um, actually, <laughs> <laughs> these students or professors are. And they're like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, it's good for them to know that you guys have gone to that, that extra step for them as well. And just for my kind of clarification, um, the when you're talking about the library licensing um so that's something let's say i've got a pdf that i like of a journal article i want my students to read yes. you rather than giving them the pdf directly just kind of navigating them through the so library you can find a permalink usually okay. um and and if you need help with that talk to your liaison okay I'm happy to help you um, and we and there, we have a guide to help support that too in the library. Um, so you can point, you can still link, but then it forces them to go to the library website, sign in with their A number, gotcha. and access it themselves rather than. Oh, thank you, Erin. <laughs> Our two brains together, <laughs> rather than just like, hey, cool, I have the PDF. Because ultimately, if they have the PDF, they've got the content, um, and they're never gonna they're never going to interact with the library like you have. Mm -hmm. But one is different than 50, for instance. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm new to USU, so this is all very helpful. So well, that was a total tangent, but. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for hijacking. No, no, it's all good. <laughs> we do have about five more minutes, so. Other questions?
and I'll just give an, a quick, I know we're, we're inundating you with all these links right now, but um, in case you don't know, everyone has their own liaison librarian. Uh, so Evie, for yours, it's, you're in geology, is that right? Yes, I am, but I'm and on the Price campus. Oh, great. Awesome. Welcome to USU. Um, so we have uh, Tegan Eastman as your librarian, just so you know. And let's see, and Tad, you know that I'm your librarian now, <laughs> math and stats, and Sarah's in foreign language. Um, oh, and Sarah, yours is Britt Fogerheim. I'm not sure if you've met her yet. And then Lacey, what um, discipline are you in? Accounting. Okay. And so yours is Casey Lundstrom. And if you ever wanted to know, I mean, we don't expect you to, to remember all of these different things we're telling you. So um, if you just go to the library website and if you click under on the left side under ask us, there's a link to which just says meet with a librarian. And that's also just great to know about, you know, you can always tell your students that too, if they ever need research help. That's what we're here for. So they can go to that site. I just put another, yet another link in, <laughs> just to round it out. One of the most important ones, because um, other specialists like me are listed on there as well. So depending on what your needs are. Okay. Well, thank you all for your time today. We really appreciate it. Good luck this semester. Yeah, thank you, Aaron and Shannon. That's excellent. I mean, you guys proved your librarians with all the links in the <laughs> chat. I think that's probably a record for any breakout session that I've seen. Did you see how so. our <laughs> breakout? Oh, oh. I, I really appreciate it, though. You you gave me some insight that I wasn't aware of prior. So, and I'm sure other people got some insights too. So, thank you all for you. Uh, joining and. Hope you had Likewise, a good conference. This is the end, I think. So <laughs> you, you survived it. Yep. Thank you again. Thanks for your engagement. Bye. Bye.